Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this webinar on synthetic biology. We are very thankful that you've made time to join us, and we are hopeful that through these discussions today, we will be able to contribute to the global discourse on synthetic biology. We are also grateful today to have the implementation support from our international partners that have joined us, and we hope to have a fruitful discussion. Distinguished colleagues, I'm honored to be the coordinator of the webinar this morning, and I thank you all for your participation. To begin, I would like to hand over to the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity to make her opening remarks. Ms. Elizabeth Maruma Mrema, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, has worked for the UN Environment Programme for over 20 years. Apart from being a noteworthy uh, su supporter of the biodiversity agenda, she's also a lawyer by profession and she has many years of implementation support in the multilateral environmental agreements. Ms. Maruma Marema, thank you very much and we'll hand over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Wazi. Let me begin by greeting uh, all the participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where we are in this virtual sitting, setting. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on synthetic biology. This webinar is being convened at pivotal time as we are confronted with the reality that biodiversity is in decline and responding to the threats to biodiversity will require the global community to work together in a transformative manner. The role of science and technology as driver of change and response mechanism cannot be underestimated. This perspective is clearly demonstrated, is clearly demonstrated when we consider the field of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is rapidly evolving, multidisciplinary field that has generated interest among numerous sectors. It has potential to bring novel solutions to addressing pressing global issues such as biodiversity loss, climate change, conservation, hunger and vector-borne diseases among others. Many applications are also beginning to appear to replace industrial processes, chemical synthesis, and produce new medicines. However, it is important to consider that as is the case for any technology, the use of synthetic biology may also come with profound risks, which if not carefully considered, may lead to adverse impacts on biodiversity, ecosystems, and the environment. Additionally, social, ethical, and economic considerations have also been raised regarding, regarding responsibility to consider the use of biotechnology and application in a manner that promotes safety and incorporates a whole of society approach such that everyone can benefit while minimizing the risks to biodiversity, global health, and the environment. In the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity, a process is underway to negotiate and adopt the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework to be adopted at the next conference of the parties expected for later next year in coming. Within the proposed framework, synthetic biology and its associated technologies can be viewed as part of a larger collection of tools and solutions to reduce threats and also meet people's needs. Promoting and ensuring their safe use will help us achieve the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Due to increasing interest, and applicability of synthetic biology. It should come as no surprise 
that many organizations have also begun exploring how synthetic biology impacts on their mandates. Thus, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Convention on Biological Diversity's webinar on synthetic biology governance and cooperation opportunities. It is indeed an honor to host this webinar as it brings together several key organizations involved in the international governance of synthetic biology. It also marks a strategic opportunity to foster networking, collaboration, and interaction between organizations and stakeholders within the field. Further, this webinar will also serve as an occasion to share information and experiences with the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as interested stakeholders. I do hope that we can come together to learn from each other, bring fruitful discussions on this topic, and explore opportunities for greener, greater global collaboration within the governance of synthetic biology. So I take this opportunity again to welcome you all to this webinar and looking forward to the rich, productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Marema, for your inspiring, welcoming remarks and for officially opening this webinar. Thank you also for contextualizing our discussions in the context of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and your words of appreciation to our uh, international partners that have joined us today. We are very grateful that you made time in between uh, supporting the global cause for biodiversity and articulated the importance that technology plays in advancing the biodiversity agenda. Thank you very much. Distinguished participants, kindly note that we would be recording this webinar and it will be made available on the Biosafety Clearinghouse for your further information. During the course of this uh, webinar, if you have any questions, kindly use the chat function on the control panel to note your uh, questions, and we will collate them as we go along. We will not have the opportunity to stop uh, between the various presentations in order to make sure that we have sufficient time for the dialogue at the end of the presentations. Should you have any technical queries or questions, also use the chat function and the secretariat is on standby to support you. With this, we will now move on to our presentations. The first presentation will be made by the secretariat to the Convention on Biological Diversity and our speaker is Ms. Marianella Araya. Marianella is a biotechnology engineer with a master's in biosafety and plant biotechnology. She has more than 12 years international experience working on issues related to biodiversity, biosafety and biotechnology. She currently serves as the environmental officer in the secretariat and is the program officer responsible for synthetic biology. Marianella, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Watsi, uh, for your introduction and um, welcome everyone. Um, let me start right now with my presentation. I hope it's visible now. So good morning, everyone, and thank you, Watsi, once again. My presentation is going to cover uh, two issues. The first one is an introduction on synthetic biology governance. And the second part is related to sharing information on the work that we do under the convention and the protocols. But before I jump into the subject matter, I just wanted to briefly share some information about this webinar, mainly to say that this is a response uh, to a request from our parties 
um, that requested the Secretariat to pursue cooperation opportunities with other organizations and initiatives on the issue of synthetic biology. And therefore, the idea and the objective of this webinar is to share information and the different perspectives of how different organizations are dealing with synthetic biology through different lenses. With this, uh, then I will start on the substance. And uh, the first part of the presentation, as I mentioned, is on synthetic biology governance cooperation opportunities. And as you can imagine, international discussions on synthetic biology have, of course, gained relevance and have come to the forefront. And of course, with that, they have drawn attention to a wide range of stakeholders that come from many different sectors. And with this, uh, we anticipate, of course, because synthetic biology is not only cross-cutting field of action, it's also advancing rapidly, but it also has potential to help address some of the global challenges related with the environment, you know, climate change, food, agriculture, health, and so many others. So with this, what is happening at the moment is that, of course, uh, there are many international discussions happening around synthetic biology, and the scenario that we have is complex, but also rich in terms of discussion and information. And even though the discussions on synthetic biology at the international level would touch on so many issues, one common issue that always come to the table is potential impacts of synthetic biology on the various sectors that it, it, it has the possibility to impact on. And here um, you can see as an example, because it is of course not an exhaustive list, uh, we have you know, potential impacts on biodiversity, on health, on well-being, security, environment, and climate change. And when I refer to impacts, I mean potential positive and or negative impacts, and these are the core of, of the discussions that are happening at the moment. And it comes as no surprise as well that uh, with these diverse range of action on different sectors for synthetic biology, you also have a wide range of stakeholders that will have an opinion and will contribute to the discussion somehow. And sometimes those contribution comes like sharing information, producing and generating information that can, of course, inform the debate on synthetic biology, uh, but also being part of international meeting and national and regional processes that will shape um, the, the discussions around this topic. And some of these actors, as you can see here, of course, includes academia and researchers, NGOs, um, IPLCs, uh, civil society, national and, 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 and sorry, international organizations, and many more. So with this, what we anticipate is that the governance of synthetic biology will be therefore sh um, somehow shaped by what is going to happen at different spheres or at different levels. And it could be what happened at an international level, regional and national level. And it is worth noting that what is going to happen in one of those levels will, of course, have an impact on what's going to happen on the other levels. But discussions could be similar and they could also be different at the same time. So often discussions at the international level for synthetic biology will cover a wide range of more generic aspects and things that will likely uh, discuss impacts on the global commons and things that we all want to protect, like the environment, the health, and so on. Uh, discussions at the regional level, on the other hand, can um, be a little bit more specific. And an example that I have here is that they can cover, for example, uh, cross-border implications from the release of applications of synthetic biology. And when it comes to the national level, discussions can be even more targeted because they will take into account um, countries' needs and priorities and the specificities of the regulatory and the policy frameworks of, of those countries. And therefore, um, discussions at a national level will take uh, into account, for example, products and processes involved and the purpose for which uh, these applications are applied. But it's important to know, though, that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is not a unique debate of the international sphere or regional or national, and it's actually um, a debate that it's complementing, and it's taken from whatever is happening at any of these levels to apply in the next one. Then um, let's go back to the international scenario, which is uh, the part that we are discussing uh, today. And I have three issues that I wanted to share with you. The first one is that because of the wide range of applications that could be produced through synthetic biology, it's cross-cutting nature, it makes it very difficult uh, to draw a clear line of action for um, the international initiatives. And this is mainly due to the fact that uh, one single aspect of synthetic biology could be, of course, within the scope of more than one organization, uh, but it could be built um, through different lenses based on the different mandates of these organizations. 
The other thing is that it's very unlikely that there will be only uh, one specific mechanism or international organization um, able to regulate synthetic biology as a whole. And instead, what we have is a combination of, of different uh, organizations and initiatives working in the field, each of them generating different, different information and contributing to the debate in, in some, uh, somehow. And the final point here was that overlaps, of course, can be expected because some of us are working on, on similar things, but that not necessarily needs to mean duplication. And instead, um, I believe that opens up the possibility for collaboration and sharing information between all of the actors that are uh, currently engaged on synthetic biology. Now, um, as you anticipate from a topic as wide as synthetic biology, uh, that it, as we have been saying that it's cross-cutting that it touches on so many actors that we will also have then uh, different uh, issues that will be somehow shaping or influencing the discussions on synthetic biology and i have here some examples uh, uh, just to say for example the issue that there are different interests from the various actors that have a role to play on synthetic biology some of them with very different expectations on what governance of synthetic biology will bring um, there's also, for example, fear of restrictiveness. Uh, if, if governance or regulation of synthetic biology, for example, move forward in some uh, sectors, what will happen? Uh, on the other hand, there's also fear of, of, of no control and coming late and you know, not having a timely response and, and that materializing in potential harms actually to, to some of those sectors. Um, discussions are also, uh, for example, um, about what should be considered for decision making, uh, what should be included in that debate, and of course also on the case by case approach, which is so important in this case, uh, considering that one size does not necessarily fits all, and considering the different applications of synthetic biology could have various impacts on various sectors at the same time, and those impacts might not necessarily be the same. So one single approach for every single application or use of technology might not be, um, or is something that concerns a uh, part of the audience, and it's also influencing the global debate. Um, the issue of ethics as well is also gaining a lot of relevance uh, recently, not only for synthetic biology, but also for you know any emerging technology as well. And under ethics, we can we can have you know discussions about, for example, participation of, of local communities or indigenous peoples that could be impacted by the use of applications of synthetic biology, as well as issues related, for example, to the pre-prior and informed consent. Um, there's also um, discussions about the lack of an agreed definition of synthetic biology, and of course the pace of development, which is very rapid and might bring challenges for some of the regulatory systems to catch up with those uh, with those changes. And with this, I think I just wanted to highlight that uh, knowledge and information sharing is therefore key uh, to help these international debate and discussions on synthetic biology. And, and to have as many uh, and as much information as possible on the table uh, for the debate. Now, that is the part of my presentation about an introduction on synthetic biology governance. And I'm going to very briefly also share with you some of the work that we do under the convention and, and the protocols. And as you know, synthetic biology is an issue discussed under the convention, but it is cross-cutting internally for the secretariat as well. And it touches on issues related to the protocols as well. And therefore, we have been requested by our parties to have a collaborative approach on this matter. And, and for those of you that are not familiar with our processes, I wanted to highlight that the convention and the protocols are a party-driven process. And what that means is that basically what comes to a program of work comes from the decisions that are made by the COP and the MOPs of, of these instruments. In terms of the substance of the discussions that we are having um, under the convention and the protocols, the discussions under the CVD are a bit more broader and they include uh, potential considerations on potential uh, benefits and, um, and potential adverse effects. Um, but they also touch on or cover organisms, products and components of synthetic biology. Um, on the other hand, discussions under the Cartagena Protocol will mainly focus on organisms, on LMOs, and, and of course on potential adverse effects as it is in line with the text of the, of the protocol itself. 
Um, then we also have discussions on DSI, uh, which is uh, very important for synthetic biology, and this is covered under the convention and also under the Nagode Protocol. When it comes to thinking, what is then, uh, the, what are the main considerations then for the upcoming negotiations under the convention and its protocols? Of course, a final word on this will come from from COP15 and from parties them, themselves at that point. But um, it's likely that they will be discussing what is the next uh, focus of the program of work. And one of the key issues that parties are discussing so far is um, the issue of horizon scanning, monitoring, and assessment of the most recent technological developments on synthetic biology. There's also considerations about um, you know, IPLCs and the free prior and informed consent, an issue that has been prominent uh, on previous synthetic biology decisions as well. Uh, likely discussions will also uh, consider how to maximize benefits while uh, minimizing the risks. And issues that are of importance for parties like capacity building, knowledge sharing, and technology transfer. And last but not least is, of course, the link of synthetic biology with the global post 2020 biodiversity um, framework. So, with that, to conclude my presentation, uh, I just want to share with you what the synthetic biology governance could mean for the CBD. And for us, it will mean um, supporting our parties on whatever decision they will take on synthetic biology. It will mean integration, knowledge sharing, technology awareness to, to be always aware of what's, what's coming, uh, strategic planning and coordination, and also implementation support mechanisms that are very much in line with the post-2020, like capacity development, knowledge management, technical cooperation. And finally, enabling conditions and synergies with other multilateral agreements as, as we are doing today. So with this, I conclude my presentation and, um, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marianella, for setting the scene and um, explaining the work under the convention. Our next speaker is Mr. Juan Carlos Vasquez. Um, from the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. And um, uh, Juan Carlos is a Colombian lawyer with postgraduate studies at the University of Geneva. And he also serves as the chief of the legal unit in the, secretar in the CITES Secretariat. Um, thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for your time and over to you. Thank you very much, and, and greetings from um, Geneva, Switzerland, and, and congratulations to our colleagues uh, from the uh, CBD Secretariat for bringing us together. On behalf of the CITES Secretary General, Yvonne Guerrero, and my colleagues, uh, we would like to, to thank all of you for attending this meeting and for the opportunity to share some of the uh, main issues discussed in the context of CITES related to uh, specimens produced through uh, biotechnology. Um, we were also very grateful for, by the, uh, for the words provided by the, the CBD executive uh, secretary uh, on, on the need to respond to these big challenges and, and, and big opportunities as well in a collective and collor collaborative uh, manner. I would like to share with you uh, very briefly uh, the key background of, of the discussion in CITES, the main mandate and the, the questions and, 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 and the, some elements of the, of the discussions in the context of CITES, a, a, a sister convention of CBD that is part of the family of the biodiversity related conventions that regulate international wildlife trade. So our main entry point into this discussion is international trade. So on the background, the conversation started uh, four years, five years ago at COP17, and that was uh, because the United States submitted a document to the Conference of the Parties suggesting that a number of companies and, and, and researchers uh, were developing uh, bioengineer rhino horn and rhino horn powder as a possible solution to the crisis of the of the illicit trafficking of in, in rhinos and rhino horns 
and uh, they also highlighted that this technology is not unique to to producing rhinos in a synthetic manner but also other wildlife products such as elephant ivory tiger bones pangolin scales etc so that that started the, the the conversation inside is about synthetic biology and based on that the conference of the parties adopted a mandate at that time to do a study on the issue and renew the mandate at the last cop two years ago to, to do the following. For the parties, uh, the, the mandate was mainly to share the cases where they have issue or receive requests to issue CITES permits and certificates for this kind of products, uh, products and uh, to also share with the, with the, with the Secretariat uh, other situations when they have applied interpretation of a resolution that is very important for us that defines what is a part and a derivative uh, uh, under CITES uh, under the whole definition of a specimen, which means what is a product regulated under CITES. Uh, and uh, this will this included also uh, the request to, to share any tech, the technological developments and applications taking place that may result in, in the manufacturing of, of uh, synthetic uh, products that may have an impact on the interpretation of, of, the, of, that, uh, of the convention. For the scientific committees, we have two, the animals and plants committees, and this is important because parties are making a, a clear difference between animals and plants. Uh, the mandate was to review a study that was commissioned by the scientific secretariat on wildlife products produced from synthetic or cultivated DNA. And, and, and monitor the most recent scientific and, and technological advancements and applications on this area, and provide the scientific advice and guidance to, uh, to the standing committee and the, and the conference of the parties. For the, for the standing committee, which is the subsidiary body between COPs making a decision on, on how to to organize this conversation, uh, the mandate was to discuss whether we need to amend or to, to reconsider the way that uh, the, the definition of what we call really, readily recognizable parole derivative to trade in, in those products uh, should be revisited or not, and to, to check all the, all the potential risks and, and enforcement uh, consequences of, of any change uh, on that uh, application of this term and communicate with the scientific committees on any matters that require scientific advice and make recommendations to the next COP. So we are going to have the standing committee in March, hopefully, uh, in, in, in France and this standing committee 74th will uh, discuss the matter. So this is the next time we are going to discuss the issue of synthetic uh, biology in CITES. And uh, th they will make recommendations to the COP that will take place in Panama in, in November from the 14th to the 25th of November, 2022. Uh, the mandate uh, for the secretariat was to, to present the study that was made to the uh, animals and plants committees with the findings and recommendations of the secretariat, collect, collect all the information and receive from parties on what they are doing on issuing permits or, or seeing uh, advancements in the uh, technological developments and applications and communicate with the CBD, with the FAO, with the UCN and other partners as appropriate. So that's why we, we are so grateful and we welcome this initiative because we have a similar mandate and it's, it's, it's very helpful to, to have this discussion today. And we need to share all the information collected, collected with, the, with the standing committee. Uh, uh, the standing committee decided the matter is a bit complex and technical, so they created a working group that is discussing the issue. This is a working group on, on synthetic uh, uh, production of, of bio, bio, via, from biotechnology. 
And this working group has 13 parties, 11 observers, and China is the chair. We have a very capable chair, uh, Ms. Yan Zheng, that is conducting and, and facilitating these discussions. And the TORs of this working group are to discuss the, the decisions by the COP on how to apply the term readable, recognizable par or derivative to trade in products of bio, uh, from biotechnological processes, uh, which may have a potential impact on the international trade in CITES listed species and, uh, and consider all the enforcement uh, uh, consequences of that application and uh, seek uh, for, for possibilities to amend existing resolutions in CITES. Again, we are a trade regulator, so we regulate trade in, in many of the products that you may be producing if they contain uh, any of the uh, uh, specimens uh, of the species listed in CITES, or if we need a new resolution on trading specimens produced from biotechnology. This, this working group is deliberating now, and they have to report to the meeting in March. And in principle, they have agreed to include all bioengineer specimens uh, in under the the, the CITES uh, trade controls and, and regulations, so uh, to include this type of specimens in resolution 9.6. Uh, but they they have uh, they have plenty of questions. So if they decide to include those specimens, what type of CITES documents should be issued? Are these documents required for all bioengineer specimens that? that contains uh, uh, set lines or, or, or DNA information or any other uh, component from, from uh, uh, animals or plants listed in CITES. And uh, they are discussing the challenges and risk for species conservation and, and what regulations are necessary and proportionate to, to manage those, those risks in, in in, in thinking in practical terms, we are very focused. We, we try uh, to be very practical and very targeted on what we discuss. So uh, we, that's why it's so important for us to monitor what's going to happen in CBD and other fora in, in the more macro, uh, um, big picture in environment on definitions, governance, etc. cetera. Uh, discussions and, and questions are around the importance of distinguishing between animals and plants because it doesn't seem to be the same. What must be demonstrated for issuing documents for this type of products? So legal questions on how to prove legality of the origin, scientific questions on the sustainability of this trade as well. Are there particular products or specimens that could benefit from simplified procedures so that they, they don't need to go through the classic uh, process, but uh, can have some uh, exemptions or special conditions? Should we use what we call annotations in the appendices for certain specimens? Uh, again, the legality of the species, uh, uh, the origin, uh, the source of this material it can be difficult if, if all the specimens are entirely synthetic. Uh, what kind of codes? We use codes to define the sourcing of the specimens and where to draw the line between the different source codes. Uh, would the same facilitations apply to new origin codes as we have for artificially propagation and captive breeding of plants and animals? And uh, uh, what is the risk of, uh, of uh, laundering of, of a, or illegal origin of, of some of these specimens for the production of these synthetic specimens? So you see well, very practical and, and complex questions that they need to resolve and they are discussing right now this content and they are going to prepare a document that will be is expected to be ready 45 days before the meeting in March. So by the end of January, we, we will have a, a first idea of what they, they will uh, recommend uh, uh, to the consideration of the standing committee meeting in, in March in, in France. Thank you very much for your attention.
Um, thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, for this informative presentation outlining the work that is taking place in our sister convention. And it's uh, very clear um, from your discussions that there are many similarities in the deliberations that we are having um, and also for sharing those very practical um, challenges that you are uh, addressing. And we are looking forward to the report in March, um, which will uh, dovetail well with our own processes in April. So thank you very much for your time. We'll now move on um, to the next presentation, which will be made by Ms. Anna Laura Ross um, on behalf of the World Health Organization. Um, Anna Laura is the head of the unit on emerging technologies, research prioritization and support in the science division of the World Health Organization. Thank you, Anna. Hello, good morning, good afternoon and good evening and uh, thank you very much for extending the invitation to the World Health Organization to this very important and informative webinar. So, um, what I'll do in the next uh, just under 10 minutes or so is to explain a little bit the work that we're doing within the science division at the WHO on monitoring science and technology. And so I'll take a little bit of a broader perspective than directly on synthetic biology, but more thinking in general how we can start to uh, initiate discussions and implement to governance solutions for monitoring science and technology. So very quickly, this uh, work sits in the science division, and uh, for those who are not familiar, this is a relatively new division of the World Health Organization. We're about two, two years old as a division. And the main mission is to really harness the power of science and innovation for the benefit of uh, global health. And within that, we have a specific goal to be forward looking and to prioritize global health research and to think about science and technology and the advances. And in fact, this is spelled out very clearly in our general program of work, where we specifically state that the WHO needs to be informed by developments at the frontier of new scientific disciplines, recognizing that these can offer transformational opportunities for global health, but also can pose potential risks. And what I want to do is, is just here give you an example of some of the recent publications that, that have come out of the science division. We have published a WHO guidance on ethics and governance of artificial intelligence for health. We also recently launched a human genome editing, a framework for governance, and we also have a guidance framework for testing genetically modified mosquitoes. And these are all recent publications and they get a little bit of a flavor of how WHO is really considering some of these areas and advances in science and technology and the ethical considerations and the government issues that we need to be thinking of. If I think specifically of the work in my unit, we have several different work streams. One is on horizon scanning and foresight, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We have a central piece of work, which is to develop a global guidance framework on responsible use of life sciences, and I'll say a bit more about that. And then a third area, which is collaboration and engagement with multiple stakeholders. And throughout the various discussions that we've been having, one phrase comes up very often, which is around shared responsibility. And I think when we are talking about any of these areas, we have to recognize that there's no one single entity or no one single group of stakeholders who can really be working on these issues. And there is a shared sense of responsibility across the groups. We have various information on our web pages. We also have some animated videos that might be of interest. So please do feel free to uh, reach out for more information. I also wanted to mention the UN BioRisk Working Group. And this working group was established on the request of the Secretary General around a year ago or so. And it is really led by the Executive Office of the Secretary General together with the WHO and UN ODA. There are a series of activities. And the first one is around the roles, responsibilities, and activities mapping. And this is one that I was asked to co-lead together with a colleague from ODA. 
And what is particularly interesting is that throughout this activity, we have been able to, to understand the various areas that, that all of the different UN entities and organizations have in bio-risk. And we define bio-risk quite broadly, so obviously the scope is relatively large. But it's really been an interesting activity, and it comes back to what was said earlier in the conversation around the collaboration and the cooperative approach. So now if I turn back to the work in my own unit, I mentioned the foresight function. And I think that this is one of the areas in which we see many different entities are increasing their own internal capacity for foresight. And, and, in, and it is the case of the World Health Organization as well. It is clear to us that we need to be able to proactively identify and in a very early way, applications of life science, but also other sectors. So the convergences with other areas such as digitalization or artificial intelligence or nanotechnologies all really come together. And we can do this through a variety of methods, so there are different tools and mechanisms that we can use for foresight. And here just is a recent publication that we published on emerging technologies, and it's a horizon scan for global public health looking at emerging technologies and dual user concerns. And so throughout this uh, expert elicitation process, we identified a series of subjects and, and both specific techniques or scientific areas, but also general governance areas. Now, I mentioned the global guidance framework. This is really one of the core products that we've been working on now for over 18 months, and it should be ready early 2022. It is intended to cover life sciences and converging sciences and technologies and to think about accidental, inadvertent and intentional misuse. And we're thinking of the impact on human health, but also biodiversity and the environment. Now, of course, from the WHO standpoint, our, our lens and our particular perspective is that of human health. But very clearly, it's difficult to separate that from biodiversity and environment. And we have to really embrace the One Health approach to think about how these areas are intertwined. So who needs to be involved and who is this framework in, aimed for? It's really here a very broad group of, of different stakeholders. We have the scientists, we have research organizations, we have scientific editors and publishers policymakers and funding bodies, but also the security actors in the private sector. And within the document, we have, uh, we, will, we have started to develop a series of principles and values for governance. And also, we want to have the tools and the mechanisms for governance and oversight. And also, we want to think about a raising, awareness raising, education and capacity building. This is one of the areas that has come up consistently through the many, many consultations and meetings that we've had in the development of this document. That is really, we need to make sure that all of the relevant actors have that awareness and have that education. So, in short, the framework will provide tools and mechanisms to promote the responsible use of life sciences and to minimize and to protect against the potential risks that can be caused by accidents or misuse. Be a series of values and principles that will guide the entire document. It will be aimed at different audiences. And importantly, we want to build it on previous activities and to make sure it's relevant to different contexts. Even when we're thinking around one specific area, such as synthetic, synthetic biology, it's very difficult to have some kind of a guidance or governance options that will cover every single aspect. And of course, for us, we've taken an even broader scope. But what we want to hope that this framework will provide is a template or plug and play model where we have some elements that can be adapted to the context, depending on the, the level, the national, the regional, the global level at which it's implemented, and the specificities of both the different activities, but also the broader context. So the framework will have some more theoretical considerations, but also we want it to be a very practical tool that people really can use to help implement some of their some of their approaches. So here are some of the preliminary key elements. I won't go through them, but we have identified nine values and principles to guide decision making. We also have highlighted the fact that we need an integrated bio-risk management approach. And this is really 
key that we need to think and we need to associate to many different perspectives and many different factors. And of course, this makes it all the more complex, but it is important to not silo off different areas. And we want to have specific scenario to show how the framework might work, as I was saying, in a very practical application. And so that we can develop these practical, robust strategies to confront a range of different plausible future scenarios. So with that, I'll just acknowledge all of the people within the division and within my own unit, and in particularly all of the members of the expert groups and working groups and contributors. There have been many, many people who have been working and continue to work, so we're very, very grateful. And with that, I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much uh, for that very interesting perspective. And um, we have certainly uh, benefited from this unique uh, role and for the introduction also to the UN BioRisk uh, Working Group. And we are looking forward to further uh, developing this uh, understanding with the World Health Organization. We will now uh, move on to the next um, speaker, and I think also a member of the BioRisk um, working group, and uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce Mr. Daniel Feeks um, from the uh, sorry from the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention um, within the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs in Geneva. He manages the activities of the unit and has served as secretary to all of the biological weapons convention meetings since 2014 when he joined the office. Uh, previously, Daniel served as the strategy and policy advisor at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague. Uh, Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Wadsi. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation um, to you and your colleagues um, to speak today. And I'd just like to echo um, thanks from all the other speakers as well. Um, I'm not sure. Can you see my presentation yet or not? Um, we can see it if you can go into presentation mode. OK. OK, is that good now? Perfect. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of slides to just explain a little bit about the Biological Weapons Convention. I appreciate that many of you may not be too familiar yet with the convention, given that it's slightly outside of the um, usual discussions, I guess, when it comes to biodiversity and, and related issues as well. So. This slide, first of all, just gives you an overview of the convention, a kind of nutshell view. Um, you can see the Biological Weapons Convention is primarily a disarmament convention that prohibits the development, production, stockpiling, acquisition, retention, or transfer of biological weapons. And I will explain what we mean by biological weapons in a moment. It was the first multilateral disarmament treaty to ban an entire category of weapons of mass destruction, um, followed more recently by treaties banning chemical weapons and more recently still um, one prohibiting nuclear weapons as well. It has a comprehensive scope, it's non-discriminatory in, in its nature, unlimited duration, and it's open to any state to join. Um, on that topic, it now has 183 states parties, so it's it's almost universal, but 14 countries still yet to join the convention. Um, I also just wanted to flag it's quite an old convention as well. I haven't looked into the, the other conventions, those dealing with biodiversity, but the, the BWC itself dates from the late 1960s. That's when the negotiations took place here in Geneva, um, and you can see a couple of pictures from that time here on the screen. It was obviously the the convention was a product of its time, the, the Cold War, um, the rivalry between East and West, and obviously at a time when issues such as synthetic biology were not, not known, not, not heard of. Um, I'd also just to, to flag as well that the convention, it's an international agreement obviously between countries, between governments, but it does also reflect a, a long-standing taboo, a kind of norm against the use of disease, the use of biological agents and toxins as weapons. 
You can see a couple of quotes here from the preamble of the convention, firstly pointing out the main objective of the convention to completely um, exclude the use of biological agents as weapons, and also reflecting that use of biological weapons would be repugnant to the conscience of mankind, as they put it back in those days. Um, so reflecting that, that norm, that taboo against using disease as a weapon, which has been there for centuries throughout um, various cultures around the world. So how does the Biological Weapons Convention work today? Uh, just to start by saying there is no international verification or compliance regime. There are no regulations made through the convention, no standards set. There is also no separate international organization, unlike uh, many other conventions, also in, in the sphere of weapons of mass destruction. What we have instead is a small three-person implementation support unit, which I head here in Geneva. We're based within the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs, which is itself a fairly small office within the UN Secretariat. So the way it really works without any central implementing or oversight agency is that its member states, its states' parties, are obliged to translate the commitments which they take on by joining the convention into effective national action within their own jurisdictions. It also functions through uh, regular diplomatic meetings here in Geneva. The highest, um, uh, most kind of prominent of those is a five yearly review conference. There are between the review conferences intercessional work programs that's currently going on. We have meetings that were due to take place last year, postponed because of COVID, which are now taking place. Uh, we had some a couple of months ago, another one coming up in a few weeks time being chaired by the ambassador of Kenya here in Geneva. So in terms of what we mean when we say biological weapons under the Biological Weapons Convention, this scope I mentioned before is very comprehensive. It's based on what's called a general purpose criterion. So the convention itself does not contain a list of biological agents. It does not contain lists of equipment or particular weapons. What it does do, you can see here in its article one, it basically says that biological weapons could be any um, biological agents or toxins, whatever their origin or method of production, unless they are produced um, and used for prophylactic and protective or other peaceful uses. So it's a comprehensive scope. It's a future-proof definition in some ways, but obviously it's not one that is easy to implement for um, regulators at the national level or for law enforcement or for customs officials, for example. And as I mentioned, no lists. You know, they, they often like to use lists of agents or equipment, so it's, it can be quite tricky um, to be implemented at the national level. The convention, as I mentioned, is is old, getting on for 50 years old, but it is updated. Um, or well, the convention itself doesn't change, but the understandings of the convention are reviewed and elaborated and reaffirmed at the five yearly review conferences. You can see some quotes here from the last one back in 2016, um, where the states parties reaffirmed that it does cover all um, you know, new methods of production, all agents are still covered. And also in the second quote that it, Article 1 of the Convention, the one I just mentioned, applies to all scientific and technological developments in the life sciences and other relevant fields as well. I mentioned also that the Convention, you know, the, the main way it works is through being implemented at the national level. This is reflected in Article 4 of the Convention. At, at the time it was negotiated, this was groundbreaking for a disarmament convention, the fact that an international treaty called upon its members to actually take action at the national level. And you can see here that states parties are required to implement the provisions and prohibitions of the Convention within their own domestic jurisdictions. There's also a requirement on states parties in Article 10 of the Biological Weapons Convention to promote the peaceful uses of biology and to avoid hampering um, the economic or technological development of states parties. So, so ever since the convention was negotiated, there's been this balance between um, the convention as a disarmament instrument, but also um, to promote the peaceful uses, the beneficial sides of technologies, as well as looking and kind of controlling the risks that technologies could um, pose as well. So just a bit more detail in terms of how the process is actually working and how the convention functions. 
at the moment, I mentioned already that there are these so-called intercessional programs between the five yearly review conferences from 2018 until 2020, actually expanded into this year uh, because of the meetings postponed last year. We have five technical meetings, these so-called meetings of experts that take place back to back generally in the summertime. You can see the different topics that they cover there. They're followed by a more political meeting, usually in the wintertime here in Geneva, the meeting of states parties, whose main function is to consider the reports of the technical meetings. I'll kind of hone in on a couple of these meetings, in particular the second one, which looks specifically at the field of science and technology. You can see here the different topics that that particular meeting of experts studies every year. It's only a two-day meeting, so the discussions are not particularly detailed uh, or technical or in-depth. But this is the meeting in particular where issues related to synthetic biology um, come up um, most prominently. Uh, just to point out a couple of things here, you can see the first um, agenda item, for example, talks about the potential benefits and risks. In fact, it mentions a couple of times uh, the positive implications and the benefits. So this is you know, it's a key, as I said before, a key balance within the convention. Um, also issues relating to risk assessment and management. Uh, the ongoing and long-running issue of a voluntary model code of conduct. Um, some of you may be aware of the recent um, development by academics in the US and China of the Tianjin biosecurity guidelines that have been endorsed recently also by the Inter-Academy Partnership as well as a, as a kind of development of the discussions within the Biological Weapons Convention on this issue. You can see that genome editing, for example, was discussed back in 2018, and then also any other relevant developments in organizations um, such as the World Health Organization and, and other related organizations as well. Just to flag also the first meeting of experts, the one on cooperation and assistance. This is the one on the peaceful um, uses of biology. Just to flag three, these are only three of the agenda items. There are more, but the three that appear to me at least to be most relevant to the discussions that we're having in this webinar today in terms of international cooperation exchanges, um, education, training, uh, you can see here as well, and particularly important for us, the promotion of capacity building, um, particularly in developing countries. So I mentioned already that the review conferences are the main kind of milestones in the evolution of the BWC. They take place every five years. You can see the main functions of the review conferences here on the screen, it, mainly to look backwards, to review the operation of the convention over the previous five years. Also more recently to look forwards and to kind of plan uh, the intercessional program for the, the coming five years. But also you can see specifically written in to the convention way back in the 1960s, early 70s when it was negotiated, were that these conferences should also take into account new um, developments in science and technology as well. So again, synthetic biology is obviously an issue that's much discussed every five years at these review conferences. Um, just to, to finish, we were you know, asked to provide some opportunities for cooperation as well. And I think this, this webinar is really highlighting that there are um, commonalities and similarities between uh, different regimes and different treaties here as well. Um, Anna Laura just referred to the um, UN Bio Risk Working Group, which I'm, I'm also involved in. Our Office for Disarmament Affairs, ODA, is one of the co-chairs of that group with the WHO. So that's one forum in which cooperation is already um, taking place and is already, you know, that's already having a, a positive impact. Some other ideas here that I just wanted to flag on the screen, um, some fairly standard basic things really, but reciprocal participation in formal meetings. For example, in just a few weeks time here in Geneva, we have this year's, or well, the postponed meeting of states parties taking place. And then the ninth review conference itself will be taking place next August. Um, also, obviously, working level contacts between relevant entities and us here in the BWC Implementation Support Unit. Um, participation as we're doing today, in fact, in informal events like this, this webinar. Um, it may be next year when the review conference meets that states parties to the convention may agree to establish a new um, uh, review mechanism for science and technology and also uh, different types of intercessional meetings going forwards as well. So they would be other opportunities for engagement and participation. 
And then finally, also other entities that may be interested to participate in the activities that we conduct to promote the peaceful uses and the beneficial um, aspects of biology as well. So just wanted to flag a few potential opportunities for cooperation and obviously happy to explore those in more detail. And if anyone does or is interested in any of that, then please feel free to get in touch with us. You can see our contact details here on the screen, particularly the email address bwc at un.org. But thanks very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Watsi. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, that certainly was very informative. And um, like you said, for those of us in the biodiversity world, um, the Bioweapons Convention does seem um, very, very far from what we do. But you have been very helpful in identifying these um, unique opportunities that exist um, for us to collaborate and the opportunities and platforms um, that we have for further cooperation in the future. And we look forward um, to working more closely with you and aligning um, some of our timeframes in the next few months. We now move on uh, to the next uh, presentation. And this presentation is coming um, from uh, Clovis um, Ferrer, um, who's an economist working in the Division on Technology and Logistics of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And he's trained as a computer engineer with a PhD in economics, um, and he's also specialized in economics of technological change and innovation. He coordinated and is the lead author of the Technology Innovation Report for 2021, focusing on how developing countries can catch the new wave of technological change to drive structural transformation and sustainable development, while minimizing the risk of increasing inequalities. Um, so this is quite uh, an important report and very relevant uh, to our discussions here today. Um, so over to you, Clovis. Clovis. Oh, thank you very much. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Um, thank you very much for the CBD colleagues for the invitation to share with you some of the new analysis of Ankitard um, on the Technology Innovation Report 2021, which we covered 11 frontier technologies, including gene editing. This presentation also highlights the issues that are usually covered in the UN Commission on Science and Technology for Development, the CSTD, to which Ankitad is the secretariat. As you know, frontier technologies are one of the main uh, forces defining the world today, but we also face the risks of rapid technological change, leaving many people behind. Well, the problem usually includes lack of capacity to absorb new technologies in many countries, lack of skills, infrastructure, financing that prevents the deployment of technology and innovation. And those are the issues that uh, usually are uh, the, the, uh, dealt in the work of ANCTAD. So ANCTAD analysis makes the point that uh, great, the great income and social divides between countries that we see today started after the industrial revolution. Since then, every wave of progress was associated with sharper inequality. Now the gap in the average income per capita between developed and developing countries is over $40,000. Uh, many factors affect the dynamics of economic inequality, including wars, epidemics like COVID-19, and the effects of trade globalization. But one of these factors is the impact of technological revolutions. So in the work of Anktad, we know that uh, we are at the peak of the age of ICT and we start in the new paradigm of Industry 4.0. And the development of ICT resulted in enormous concentration of wealth in the ownership of major digital platforms. There are also persistent digital divides as highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So how frontier technologies will affect inequalities between countries will depend on national policy, but also the involvement of countries in international trade, trade partners, production partners, and technological and productive capacities of countries. 
Uh, so as I mentioned, the report covers 11 technologies. The latest report that we have on frontier technologies, it covers gene editing, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, big data, blockchain, 5G, 3D printing, robotics, drone, nanotechnology, and solar photovoltaic. So estimates suggest that these technologies already represent a $350 billion market and one that by 2025 we could grow to over $3.2 trillion. Many of the major providers of these technologies are from the United States and China, which are responsible for 30 to 60% of patents and publications. In the case of gene editing, the market is expected to reach $9.7 billion in 2025. Research in this area is also led by the United States and China, followed by UK. During the period from 96 to 2018, the top affiliations of publications in this area were the Chinese Academy of Science and Harvard Med Medical School. Within the same period, the top nationalities of assignees of patents were the United States, Switzerland, and China. On the supply side, the market has been driven by increasing funding for research and development and improvement in genetic engineering technologies. And in the demand side, the market is driven by case of infectious disease like COVID-19, the use of food industry, um, also genetic, genetically modified crops and increasing demand for synthetic genes. Uh, we also come up with a new readiness index report that gives a picture of the national capabilities to equitably use, adopt and adapt from the technology. And what we see is that in general, the economy is most ready to for this equitable use deployment of frontier technologies are in North America and Europe, it's not surprising, and most least ready countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So preparing for this revolution requires promoting uh, the use of this technology, the adoption and adaptation of frontier technologies. But developing countries face many challenges, and I would like to highlight three of them here. The first is that uh, is the technological gap. You know, for example, in the past 30 years, the gap in output per work work between low and high income countries increased from $60,000 to $90,000. Another challenge is this low diversification in many developing economies that are still dependent on commodities instead of moving to manufacturing. So common technologies used in manufacturing, they help uh, firms to adopt and adapt these new technologies. Also, stringent intellectual property rights are likely to reinforce existing technological divides. We see these effects of this challenge now during the COVID-19 pandemic. The technological gap and low productive capacity in developed countries have led to vaccine inequity around the world. So far, almost half of the world population has received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, but only around 2% of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Africa. Developing countries so need to adopt these frontier technologies, but they also need to continue to diversify their production base by mastering existing technologies. These both things should be done together. So they need to align innovation industrial policies, keeping the national industry competitive. It's a lot of work of Antad on that. This will require better access to patented uh, technologies and opportunities for technological learning. Some of the finance for innovations can come from impact investment, venture capital, crowdfunding, innovation, technological funds. Also, policy makers need to anticipate the impact on the workforce and workers should also be able to rely on the stronger mechanisms of social protection. Also, labor unions may have a bigger role to play to protect uh, the rights of workers. Now let's turn to the other side of the analysis, the potential impact of technology on inequality through the perspective of the users of the technology. One of the most critical aspects is access, which can be considered comprised of a combination of five A's, availability, affordability, awareness, accessibility, and the ability for effective use. And again, developing countries face particular challenges. A major issue, of course, is the higher level of poverty in developing countries. We know that in upper middle income and high income countries, the average share of population living in extreme poverty is only around 2%, but in low income countries, this is 45%. So as a result, access to goods and services are much more difficult for a larger share of population in developing countries. Um, other major concerns are related to the bias, design, and unintended consequence of AI, but also inequalities and ethical considerations of gene editing. 
And regarding gene editing, its development and application for sure may bring several benefits, but they are also likely to be unevenly distributed. Uh, for example, a study from 2019 shows that most clinical trials of gene therapy have been carried out in the United States and Europe. It's almost over 60% or, or 7%. Most non-clinical gene editing studies have also been conducted mainly in the U.S., most, uh, more than half of it. In relation to intellectual property, most of the research is in developing, developed countries. So, and then ownership of technology could limit the contribution of these technologies in addressing challenges of developing countries, particularly those related to food production and health. And gene editing also raises uh, ethical, ethical questions, such as what constitutes an ideal human being. This also could result in an underclass of people who cannot afford genetic uh, treatment. So developing countries should be able to rely on international cooperation to promote and guide the development and deployment of new technologies so that they support inclusive and sustainable development. Um, in the work of ACTAD and the Commission Science Technology for Development, we particularly focus on building stronger national capacities in science, technology, innovation, workforce, smooth technology transfer, for the increase of women participation in tech sectors innovation, to improve foresight and technological assessment, to better understand the socioeconomic and environmental implications of frontier technologies, and to promote inclusive debate on how new technologies affect people and society and how they can use to promote the SDGs. So uh, let me conclude with the following point. Uh, the UN Commission on Science Technology for Development, CSTD, as the UN Intergovernmental Body on Science and Technology for Sustainable Development is a, is a place for, uh, uh, for an impartial and trusted platform where the international community can deliberate about the issues that I have been mentioned in my presentation. But this STD, it, it only adds, it complements the work of the UN system and other UN mechanisms. There are these, all these mechanisms that we have here in now in this session, they are critical to devise policies also for smooth, smooth technological transfer and to give an equal voice to developing countries in addressing the impact of technological change on societies and also on the planet. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward for the discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, Clovis, um, for that insightful presentation and for sharing with us the highlights from this report um, that clearly uh, demonstrates that there is um, real uh, development in synthetic biology, and this has been very useful for contextualizing our discussions today. We look forward to working with you um, as we go forward. Uh, distinguished delegates, our last presentation will be um, from the IUCN. I think we lost um, what's his connection uh, for a second, so I will continue in the meantime. Um, we're going to proceed now with the last presentation, which is uh, coming from IUCN, and the first speaker will be Mr. Thomas Brooks, uh, Chief Scientist of, of IUCN, and he will be joined by Sonia uh, Peña Moreno uh, to complement the presentation later on. So Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, to the CBD Secretariat for the invitation to present uh, IUCN's work on synthetic biology here. Um, and uh, particular thanks to the Executive Secretary for her insightful uh, opening comments for this webinar. Um, uh, thank you too there for the uh, skillful adaptive use of uh, technology in, uh, uh, in starting, uh, starting the, uh, the session here. Um, this is going to be um, the, the IUCN work on synthetic biology is very much um, at the interface between science and policy. Uh, so we're actually going to going to present in a, in a tag team today to reflect this. Um, as IUCN uh, chief scientist, I'll say 
a few words to start to uh, talk about the underlying science of IUCN's work. And then I'll hand over um, to Sonia Peña Moreno, uh, director of IUCN's International Policy Center to talk about the policy aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So the underlying mandate um, to IUCN's work on synthetic biology is that in 2016, IUCN's membership of about 200 governments and government agencies and more than a thousand non-governmental organizations and indigenous peoples organizations passed a resolution asking IUCN as a union to do five specific things related to the interface between biodiversity conservation and synthetic biology. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the first four of these here, um, and then Sonia will pick up in the pick up uh, pick up uh, on the fifth uh, the policy development work in her comments. Um, I'll ask uh, maybe uh, the secretariat could uh, paste the the link uh, to the resolution are uh, highlighted there uh, into the chat so that all participants uh, do have that available. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the uh, operative paragraphs of the 2016 resolution asked IUCN to seek the necessary resources to undertake uh, work at the interface between biodiversity conservation and synthetic biology. Um, from the very outset, it was decided to avoid seeking funding from either uh, campaigning non-governmental organizations or from the private sector. Um, and so to so seek uh, resources to uh, support the work uh, from, from governments, from foundations and from research institutes. Um, and so on this basis, uh, the, the Swiss and the French uh, governments um, the Luke Hoffman Institute, the Moore Foundation, and the Seagar Foundation uh, very generously provided uh, support for the work. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, with 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 that um, support in hand, IUCN's six independent expert commissions then undertook the technical assessment, which was mandated in the first two paragraphs the first two paragraphs of the 2016 resolution. Um, in leading this work, I should particularly credit uh, Dr. Kent Redford for his, um, his chairpersonship of the task force which delivered this assessment. He was appointed jointly by all six chairs of IUCN's independent expert commissions. Um, and I'll also um, uh, uh, credit and, and, and thank all of the other task force members and technical subgroup members who contributed to the process. The assessment was published in 2019 um, in all three official IUCN languages um, and accompanied by a synthesis and key messages document. Um, and again, maybe I could ask uh, if the secretariat could kindly uh, paste the um, the links uh, to those um, to those uh, uh, documents into the chat, please. Thanks uh, so much for doing so. And on to the next slide. Given that the mandate was that the assessment should be evidence based, it used the classification of quantitative uncertainty terms that are widely used in other international assessment processes, such as in the IPCC and in IPBES, uh, to document the level of agreement and level of evidence underlying each key message. Next uh, slide, please. The, the fourth um, operative paragraph of the resolution mandated a robust peer review process. Um, and the peer review process for the assessment was conducted in the second half of 2018. Um, it generated uh, uh, about 750 um, peer review comments from uh, no less than 44 peer reviewers. Um, all of those comments were addressed um, with standard documentation of how they were addressed, provided in a tracking table, which itself has been made available online. Next uh, slide, please. So 
what about the what about the content? What were the key messages that emerged from the assessment? Um, I'll very briefly summarise the ten high-level points that um, that uh, that were the that comprised the key messages of the the assessment. Um, the first was very simply on the importance of the the importance of the interface between synthetic biology and biodiversity conservation. Um, and indeed, this webinar today and the breadth of uh, input from the panelists that we've heard really underscores that importance. The second key message was that conservation, as has been 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 documented uh, uh, most recently in the in the the global uh, biodiversity outlook from the CBD. Um, is really struggling to address the crisis of biodiversity, that, that internationally agreed targets are not being met and that new tools, additional tools to strengthen the conservation toolbox are needed and that synthetic biology could help with those. The third key message is that synthetic biology is growing extremely fast, a five-fold growth over the last 15 years. Um, we've heard more of that in the, in the, immediate, uh, in the presentation immediately preceding this one um, from UNCTAD. The fourth key message um, is that uh, techniques to drive preferential in inheritance of particular elements um, or engineered gene drive have particularly large potential implications for biodiversity and conservation. The fifth key message is that there is substantial prospect for positive impacts onto bio biodiversity conservation from synthetic biology, for example, in the control of invasive alien species. Uh, next slide, please. Key message number six, um, as, a, as a corollary and a counterbalance to the previous point, is that there is also substantial prospect of negative impacts of synthetic biology on biodiversity conservation. For example, through a de detrimental impacts on non-target organisms. The seventh uh, key message was on the importance of values and worldviews in shaping responses to how synthetic biology can and should interface with conservation. Key message number eight, um, this is one I'd particularly like to emphasize. It hasn't come through uh, very much in the panelists, in the comments from the other panelists today, um, is that indigenous people and local communities have particularly important roles to play in these responses. Given that both the potential positive and the potential negative impacts of synthetic biology may well impact those people disproportionately. Key message number nine is that while many decisions about synthetic biology and conservation can be delivered by existing governance structures, and we've heard about some of these today, um, the very rapid developments of and um, in the nature nature of the technology may well challenge those existing governance structures, and so new governance mechanisms may need to emerge. And the final uh, final point is that given the very di the, given the diversity and given the rapid expansion of synthetic biology, it's really important to consider that risk assessment needs to be undertaken on a case by case basis. Again, a point that's emerged from other other comments today. Final uh, couple of slides from me. Next slide, please. Um, just two um, two overarching uh, infographics to leave you with. Um, the first of these is to emphasize that while some synthetic biology impacts on biodiversity conservation may be direct, um, these will likely be overshadowed by the range and magnitude of indirect impacts of synthetic biology applications in other sectors. And again, I'd really, uh, really credit the the the, the all uh, panelists in this webinar today for bringing that range of different, uh, different sectoral perspectives to the, to the discussion. Um, next slide, please. And finally, to emphasize both the potential positives and the potential negatives of the interface between synthetic biology and biodiversity conservation. Uh, this was a point which the executive secretary emphasized in her opening comments, and which I think that, that, that actually all of the panelists uh, in the webinar have mentioned today. And with that, uh, over to Sonia Peña Moreno to pick up on the policy aspects. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, Tom, and hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next uh, few slides, next slide, please, is to uh, briefly refer to the newly adopted uh, resolution at our newly uh, at our um, uh, recent World Conservation Congress in Marseille, Resolution 123 entitled Towards the Development of an IUCN Policy on Synthetic Biology in Relation to Nature Conservation. I want to highlight here that this uh, resolution uh, adopted last September builds on the resolution that Tom just referred to and explained to you, um, and it actually provides a new mandate to continue working on this field for IUCN as a membership union. Uh, I have included here in the slide the, the break of the vote at the World Conservation Congress for the approval of this resolution. So as you can see in both houses, category A is our uh, state and government agencies um, membership, and the category B and C are the NGOs and uh, the IPO, so indigenous people organizations. So as you can see, it uh, passed in both houses. Next slide, please. So what does the resolution actually say? It basically reaffirms the fundamental importance of considering the precautionary principle when we talk about synthetic biology and engineered gene drives. It acknowledges that there remain uh, significant data and knowledge uh, gaps that must be uh, assessed and addressed. Uh, it, made, um, it, it notes that the field of synthetic biology is advancing rapidly, and we have heard it throughout this uh, panel discussion today. It also notes that uh, uh, synthetic biology, including, again, gene drives, continues to be discussed and scrutinized. At the CVD, in its doing, uh, in, in, in within its protocols, and also, as well as uh, other um, international agreements like CITES, and we heard that before from Juan Carlos and Marianela also referred to, uh, to this work at the very beginning. It also emphasizes that there is a unique role for IUCN because of uh, the way that we're uh, governed, uh, the way that we're constituted in engaging governments, NGOs, indigenous people's organizations to foster dialogue, build knowledge on this topic, which is much uh, needed. Next slide, please. So what is it actually calling for? Uh, and, and it has four main areas of work or four ma major asks. The first one is uh, requesting the director general, the commission chairs and members also to initiate an inclusive and participatory process to develop an IUCN policy on this topic. It requests the IUCN council, which is the equivalent to a bureau uh, to create a working group that is composed of IUCN members, ensuring a whole range of issues, including you know, uh, balance among genders, regions, perspectives, etc. Uh, it also requests the Council to establish a drafting and participatory review process, similar to the process that was carried out under the mandate of Resolution 86 that uh, Tom referred to. And finally, it calls upon the Director General, basically the Secretariat of IUCN and its commissions to remain neutral on all aspects of synthetic biology until the formal adoption of this IUCN policy on synthetic biology. So those are the four main blocks of this resolution. Next slide. But it does go deeper, let's say, in, in identifying what needs to happen and how that process must unfold. So there, has, um, there are different sections in the resolution itself that specify this process. The first section is the terms of reference for this inclusive process to happen. And here, I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, details and you can, have, uh, you can access also the, the resolution itself. We can share the, the link uh, later. But here, the purpose, I think it's, it, and it must be emphasized that it, the, the purpose of this inclusive process that it set or called for in the resolution is to inform discussions, promote further consultation, and support improved understanding. So with here, um, uh, here I think it's, it's worth emphasizing that there is uh, recognition, as I mentioned before, from IUCN membership, that there are still a lot of uncertainties uh, on this particular topic that necessitate further 
uh, work and further discussion. Uh, and this um, process should, again, strive to achieve a widely diverse participation across IUCN members. What is interesting about IUCN, again, is, is this wide-ranging coverage of uh, the members of IUCN, which can range from you know, really small national local NGOs to big uh, government agencies, uh, etc., and states. So next slide, please. Um, we are running out of time, Sonia. Yeah, we're, uh, we're just going to go briefly into two other uh, sections of the, and then conclude. So another section is uh, specifying the terms of reference for the working group. And as you can see there, I'm not going to go into, into details. The working group will be composed by different uh, uh, constituencies of IUCN and will steer the work of development of the policy. Next slide. The section three has two subsections. One is uh, specifying the guiding criteria for the development of the, uh, of the policy uh, process. And you can see the types of criteria that our members were um, you know, emphasizing must be uh, followed. Next slide, please. And then finally, the section B of that, uh, or subsection B, specifies further that process. And as you can read through there, the idea is to uh, um, establish a, an iterative process by which a first draft of the policy is developed. It goes back to the council. The council asks for, feed for feedback from our members. Members pr provide feedback. It comes back to the council. It, there is another round of uh, work uh, steered by the working group, another draft, and a third draft is prepared after all. And that third draft is the one that will uh, presumably be taken by the council with a covering motion to the next IUCN World Conservation Congress to be then again debated, uh, consulted, and uh, uh, potentially adopted as an IUCN resolution, thus an IUCN policy on synthetic biology. And the final slide is just to spell out uh, our next steps. So formally, the launch of this process will be taking place uh, in February 2022, when our council first meets and uh, discusses how this is uh, this is all set up. But I will encourage all of you to keep posted. Uh, we, we try and, and keep up uh, uh, updating our uh, webpage dedicated to this work. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion on further collaboration across our organizations and stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, both to you and Tom, uh, for this very informative discussion and also for sharing um, the information on the resolutions uh, with us. And it's probably the most closely related uh, to the work that is happening under the convention and the opportunity for us to uh, coordinate our processes and really add um, the information, similar information is, is critical. So we thank you very much for um, your time and for the input. And uh, distinguished delegates, you can continue um, to look in the chat and get um, access to the links on the IUCN process. Um, so this brings to an end um, the suite of presentations that we have had, and I'd really like to thank um, all the speakers for, for their very informative uh, presentations. I will now hand over to um, our colleague um, from uh, UNEP who will moderate the questions for us. Um, Dr. Balakrishna Pisupati um, is the program manager at UNEP focusing on issues of international environmental governance and the science policy interface. He has been working on issues of synthetic biology, law, policy, and science since 2010, and he's currently leading UNEP's work on synthetic biology. So, Bala, over to you for the moderated discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vatsi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, uh, you know, certainly, uh, I should say, uh, what a what a breadth of uh, presentations, uh, focal areas, uh, priorities, 
and emerging issues that we have heard in the last, uh, uh, you know, almost about 70, 80 minutes uh, from a number of organizations. And I'm sure for the 200 plus audience who actually are with us at this time, uh, certainly it's uh, not only provides you a kind of a perspective of the technology, the science, the policy, and the practice interface, but it also provides you a kind of uh, uh, discussions, the kinds of prioritization, the kinds of decision making uh, that countries, the member states, and the groups should be focusing on in the months to come. Essentially, uh, as it was indicated at the beginning of the webinar, uh, in preparation for the 15th meeting of the Conference of Parties, as well as the adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, that definitely will have implications about this particular technology. And we will sort of open the floor for some comments, questions. We have received some questions, but let me just quickly put you a bit of a perspective to this discussion. You know, what we have heard is the science, uh, the preparations from various agencies guided by the member states and also the policy implications or the policy emergence that is happening all around us from various different aspects. But if you're looking at it from the industry perspective, if you're looking at it from the investment perspective, some of the numbers are extremely revealing. You know, between the first quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021, in just one year, we have seen the investments in synthetic biology jump from about $9.5 billion to about $46 billion. And the first two quarters of 2021 in itself have already seen more than $10 billion worth of investment where the science and the technological advancements that are happening in this field is really going at breakneck speed. And we're all trying to catch up to discuss about the policy issues. And that's where this seminar, this webinar is very, very pertinent and timely because we are discussing the issue of cooperation. We are discussing the issue of governance. So let me open the floor for questions with a very general question. But of course, um, I would like to direct it to uh, specifically two colleagues who are on the panel from whom we have heard. One is the kind of uh, issue that we often hear, foresight analysis and horizon scanning. I like our colleague from uh, WHO to actually focus on that particular aspect of uh, the future in terms of how are we going to be focusing on the issue of foresight and how are we going to be focusing on the issue of horizon scanning because that particular discussion is extremely relevant and it is also on the table for the contracting parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity as well. Uh, over to you, Anna Dora Ross. And I think you are muted, Anna. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Pisapachi, for that question. And I think it's a really a very important one. And what we're seeing across UN entities, but also other organizations, is really an increase in foresight, capacity, and thinking ahead. And so this is clearly something which is recognized as being absolutely instrumental, that we have to, in any area and in any scope of work, we have to be proactively identifying, but also implementing the changes that need to take place today to be able to construct the preferred future or the, the most uh, uh, best scenario future that we want to think of. And I think that we also recognize that today there is an advance in the rate and the pace of innovation and that the advances in science technology are really taking up a lot of speed. And from our perspective at the World Health Organization, we really see these opportunities as being hugely beneficial for global health. And of course, if we think about synthetic biology, there are many of these positive applications, but there are also potential risks. And in both cases, when we think about the, the benefits, but also the potential harms, thinking about any issue proactively and trying to implement today mechanisms and tools and considerations and to inform policy decision making is absolutely crucial. So I think that we will see across the board an increase in the use of foresight. Of course, it's not foolproof. We can't predict the future, but we do have a series of mechanisms and tools and approaches 
that allow us to have a reasonable sense to predict what might be potential plausible future scenario and then work backwards to be able to do what we call backcasting to inform decision and policy making. Thank you, thank you. I mean, that sort of the last point that you mentioned is certainly relevant to at least two of the presentations that we heard today. One from our colleague from Antar, Mr. Clovis Ferrere, Doctor, and also Juan Carlos. And you know, even within the multilateral environmental agreements, we always consider scientists to be, you know, using much more technologically advanced features in terms of enforcement and compliance issues. But one quick question to both uh, uh, Dr. Clovis and also to Mr. Juan Carlos from CIPIS is that given the nature of developments that are happening within the area of science and technology, one, we have looked at the horizon scanning, we have looked at the UNCTAD report in terms of the innovations that are happening, and we also heard about the kind of implications for some of these discussions in a convention like CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Any quick reflections on where you see some of these things translating into solutions that can be found in the context of implementation of some of these multilateral environmental agreements? Uh, Dr. Clovis, you have the floor first. Thank you very much, Dr. Pisopati. I think that uh, in the context of, uh, of the Commission on Science Technology for Development, the, the, the opportunities are to identify uh, ways to give direction and to increase the pace of, uh, of adoption of the technologies in a sustainable and inclusive manner. And for that, you need to strengthen um, the national innovation systems. You have to build the capacity of firms, of farms, of people for this period of rapid change. And uh, the, our, in, the, in the context of the CSTD, the Commission on Science Technology for Development, our main counterparts are our ministries of science, technology, and innovation. And, uh, and where they can help on this effort is really to, to direct the innovation system towards these more inclusive and sustainable outcomes of the use of these technologies. Thank you. Uh, Juan, over to you. Because certainly, uh, no, I, no, no one can envy you in terms of the agenda you have for the forthcoming COP on this particular issue. Over to you. Thank you, Bala. Thank you very much. And, and to all the, the panelists uh, for the, uh, the insights. I, I'm learning a lot. Uh, but I think that we can schematize this in, in scientist terms as moving from the wild to the farm and from the farm to the lab. So we are in a transition moment. And these transitions uh, impl have implications, as you say, these innovations uh, change the regulatory landscape as well and the governance uh, and uh, that's why all of us are having mandates to work on this and develop strategies policies rules and and uh, again this is why this this exercise is so valuable for all of us and i imagine we have industry ngos i uh, local communities and indigenous people listening to us today so i think that in terms of the governance, uh, you have noticed that all many of us have working groups. So it's important that all these actors are, are part of these working groups. And I would like to be part of the working groups created by IUCN and by CBD and, and others. And also, you are welcome. I think you are already members of our working group. And we have meetings where we are going to discuss this document, this, 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 findings and, and conclusions. So you are also inviting to invited to follow and attend these meetings and share your, your views and concerns. I think that uh, well from you we 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 have a big spectrum now from trade to health to war to peace uh, to biodiversity, intellectual property, ethical issues. So we have a large uh, spectrum of issues and probably we need to divide the labor uh, in a smart way to avoid duplication and also to 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 add uh, to to have a, a coherent uh, final product uh, collective uh, product. Uh, so uh, we are in 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 the regulator sector and we are hard law. 
So what we decide will have implications for, for the citizens uh, quite rapidly. So we need your help to, to assist us in, in developing rules that make sense, that doesn't hinder or complicate the, these innovations, but also that mitigate the risks. And that's, that's the big challenge is how to balance the, the, the challenges and the opportunities that this, this new science, but just to, to close, uh, now with the development of the vaccines for the COVID, uh, we were regulating a lot of the trade in, in the samples uh, because many of these things come from nature. And that, that will be my closing remark on this transition between the wild to the lab. What is the place of nature in all this? Uh, because that, that, that's a risk for us. Uh, and we have seen that when we move from the wild to the farm, we lost some interest in the value of the ecosystems and the species in, in their habitats. So there are things to, to take into consideration uh, in this discussion that we are very happy to, to join and, and willing to, to continue the engagement with all of you. Thank you, Bala. Thanks, Juan Carlos. Uh, we actually have one question from a participant that is directed to our colleague, Daniel Peach, uh, uh, where the question goes that, how would you consider synthetic biology or synthetic technology product that becomes a risk causing mass destruction? Thanks for very much for the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I mean, quite, quite simple. I mean, if the intention, as I said in my presentation with this general purpose criterion, so if the intention of the person using, uh, dispersing, um, you know, circulating the particular agent is to cause harm, whether it's to cause harm to animals, plants, or humans. And harm doesn't just mean death, but can also just mean, you know, injury. Um, then it's a biological weapon. And if the intention is to do that, a biological weapon, then it's a violation of the Biological Weapons Convention. Now, I mentioned before that the convention itself is a, as a treaty between um, its states, uh, the, the governmental at the national level. So you would be talking about a, a country potentially violating the convention, but each country, as I also mentioned, is required to translate all of those prohibitions that countries have down to the individual, you know, the, the domestic, the individual level, so that each of their citizens is also prohibited from doing that kind of thing as well. So those, you know, doing something like that with the intent to cause harm to plants, animals, or humans would, by a state, would be a violation of the Biological Weapons Convention, by an individual, would be a violation of any laws that that particular country that that person is on the territory of um, would, have, would have violated as well. Thank you, thank you. Quite useful, quite useful. Because, I mean, one thing if we can take away from this particular webinar is just not the complexity of the issue of science and policy and the regulatory aspects related to synthetic biology, but also the different mandates within which institutions actually are working. I mean, this particular webinar in itself actually lays that particular scenario quite significantly. And one stakeholder group, which is also a question that has come in the chat box, are the non-state actors. And uh, this question I'd like to sort of uh, direct to colleagues from IUCN, Tom and Sonia. Uh, in terms of uh, the participation of non-state actors, not just in looking at the technology, but also on the implications of using the technology, deployment of the technology. And the question also goes into something very specific on the role of young engineers and young scientists in terms of future of this technology and use of this technology. Any thoughts, uh, Tom, followed by Sonia? Maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, 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 kick off and um, and then um, and then hand over to uh, hand over to to, to Sonia for 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 for, for additional uh, additional comments. Um, Maybe maybe a couple of uh, a couple of thoughts from from me that um, would address uh, both 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 the specifics uh, of your question on on non-state actors there, Bauer, but also um, um, also the broader context of the discussion so far around um, around uh, uh, horizon scanning um, and foresight and and rapid uh, uh, technological innovation. Um, Maybe, 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 maybe a couple of uh, a couple of points to 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 emphasise there. One, I think, um, um, and this this came through in Anna, Anna Laura's points as well. Um, 
that um, that that given the fact that we don't know now what many of the technologies of tomorrow will show um, and will 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 enable um, adaptive um, adaptive governance, adaptive decision making becomes becomes extremely extremely important. Um, that's uh, reflected in the the points that emerged in the IUCN assessment around uh, around the, the the importance of case by case decision making. Um, it's um, it also um, um, is 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 reflected and specifically to your point on on non state actors um, in the importance of, um, of of breadth of governance and of participatory governance. Um, this um, this came through. I think I thought very nicely in in Marianella your your opening slide of the the different levels of governance regimes uh, for, for for synthetic biology and and biodiversity. Um, but yes, absolutely, the 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 intergovernmental mechanisms, the treaties, and uh, and uh, national laws. Um, but um, but very much also the um, the prospects of harnessing. Um, more, more, more locally nested, uh, locally uh, driven uh, governance uh, mechanisms um, for helping to inform uh, inform uh, uh, decisions about uh, synthetic biology um, for those um, for those people and those communities who may be may be most affected by those decisions. Um, let me hand over to you, Sonia, for any any other points there from our side. Yeah, I would just complement that. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I just emphasizing what I mentioned in the in the presentation about the the uniqueness of uh, the the model or the approach in IUCN whereby uh, you know the tent is open for the discussion of all these different actors that perhaps have not sufficient space to to uh, you know express their views or concerns or uh, positive or negative uh, opinions or or um, knowledge about this issue in other spaces and that's uh, i think very valuable on on the side of iucn and what also makes a bit um uh, you know the pace slower in terms of how this uh, advances or progresses uh, uh time wise vis-a-vis -vis the rapid pace that we all recognize the technology is 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 picking up so at the end of the day the i, I think an important question for all of us is how do we balance that rapid pace of you know synthetic biology applications and uh, you know the the pace of that technology advancing vis-a-vis -vis the quote-unquote slow pace of the governance regulatory frameworks and policy development part of things to counter you know that that uh, that rapid pace and be on the safe side when we deploy these technologies and so I think that there, there is a lot of opportunity and scope for uh, collaboration across uh, the board in this space, uh, you know, uh, filling those gaps in knowledge and information, raising awareness about implications of uh, the application of uh, synthetic biology in different fields, uh, but also capacity building, you know, uh, focusing on the localized and very specific cases. As, as Tom was saying, one of the things that came out from the assessment that IUCN developed this precisely that uh, that focus on the case by case we have to be adaptive to the context and not you know a blanket approach to uh, all the applications of the technology thank you Sonia. i think that's a valid point the speed with which the science and technology is evolving and the speed with which the policy and the regulatory responses to the technology and the deployment of the science and technology certainly are not keeping the same speed you know, if you look at the investments that went in the last uh, first quarter of uh, 2000 and second quarter of 2021, uh, the recent report from SynBioBeta indicate that we had $2 billion worth of new investment for relatively uh, new technology in synthetic biology, which is called organism engineering. We have heard of organism engineering significantly, but we never had seen much of investments coming, but just in the last three months, uh, between the second quarter of 2021, we've seen close to $2 billion worth of investment going into just one particular component of synthetic biology research and synthetic biology deployment. So certainly you are right. I mean, we should keep our eyes and ears open the speed with which the technology and science are growing. But also it is a challenge for negotiators. It is a challenge for contracting parties and governments 
to actually look at the policy making, to look at the regulatory frameworks, because a lot of times the speed of technology and the speed of response of policy, if they are not keeping the same pace or same speed, uh, relatively the policy becomes redundant or the policy becomes a little challenging. That is actually based on the technological advancements that happen. And certainly synthetic biology in the months and years to come will prove to be a bit of a challenge for the policymakers to keep up that particular speed. But related to that, one another stakeholder group, one another very important voice that significantly requires to be heard, and essentially this is in the context of the convention discussions on synthetic biology is the voice of indigenous people and local communities. How do we mainstream? How do we consider the interests the aspirations, the apprehensions of the indigenous and local communities in trying to deal with synthetic biology policy and regulatory aspects. And Marianella, because you are in the thick of some of these discussions, any reflections from you on where we are and what's the future looking like? Yeah, thank you, Bada. Certainly. Um, on the convention and the protocol, certainly the issue of engagement of indigenous people and local communities have always been a priority and very prominent in the decision if you go to the decisions on synthetic biology is something that it's always been present. However, um, I think there's a general feeling that uh, we can do more uh, to make sure that all the stakeholders and specifically those from local communities uh, that might be impacted somehow uh, by the developments of the technology could be um, having a place on the table to, to express their views. And the other important point that it's also part of the discussions is not only how to engage them, but how to engage them in a meaningful way. And um, under the convention, the experience that I can share is that, of course, um, uh, IPLCs and the civil society in general, they, they have um, an opportunity to participate, even though we have a party-driven process, of course, at the, at the end of the day to make the decisions. Uh, our meetings are always open to the participations. And also some of our processes, like, for example, when we have the setting of, of an ad hoc technical expert group, like the one that we have for synthetic biology. Um, now, um, we have participation of indigenous people and local communities in the group as well. And when we have activities such as the online forum, for example, uh, where we gather important information uh, that will then eventually feed into the documents that will inform the discussions from the parties, uh, those processes are, of course, open to everyone, uh, including IPLCs. But I think the point that I want to make now is that we know that it's very important to include not only IPLCs, but everyone who has an interest or who can be impacted by this and make sure that this is a very inclusive process, but we need to do that in a better way. We need to find ways to do that in a more meaningful way. One issue that sometimes it's a challenge is the language issue and how we communicate um, our findings, how we communicate our policies, how we communicate our you know, wishes and way of working, and whether or not that is in a way that people can, can actually uh, understand it and, and use it. Uh, which is more important. So I think I think there's still lots of work to do, but there is a lot of goodwill um, to to move along those lines uh, under the convention, and and I'm sure that the parties uh, will look at it that way in the next uh, round of discussions. Thank you, thank you, Marinella. Uh, we are almost uh, nearing the closure of uh, the time for this webinar. Uh, any quick final thoughts? Just one key message from each one of the panelists. Uh, to the participants, maybe we'll start with Anna Laura Cross from WHO. Thank you very much. I mean, one thing that I'll be taking away is really the sense of how certain specific areas actually are need the involvement and concern so many different groups. And so this is actually a group, the panelists here, I'm delighted to be part of this panel. They're not normally typically the stakeholders that I would be interacting with, but it's absolutely crucial and it's essential. And I think we need to think of ways to promote more cross-sectorial discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Daniel Peaks from the Biological Serpents Convention. Daniel. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, just, I mean, really what, what Anna Lauer just said, I mean, uh, 
that it's obvious from the discussion and people's introductions that a few of us are actually based here in Geneva as well. So it shouldn't it shouldn't actually be too difficult. I mean, we can get together online with people from around the world, but given that so many of us seem to be here in Geneva, we could even get together physically as well. So no, I mean, it, it really shows you, I mean, we're talking about the same, um, you know, the same topic, synthetic biology, but we're all coming from different different aspects of that topic. But I think each of those aspects is, is valid, is legitimate, and, you know, we need to take all of these different things into account to have a, a proper, you know, a proper picture of the of the whole topic. So yeah, I think really, you know, thanks very much to colleagues in CBD Secretariat for organizing this, and I hope it's the, the first of many similar um, webinars and interactions as well. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Juan Carlos? Thank you, Bala. Yeah, I, I concur with uh, Daniel and take the invitation uh, seriously. So <laughs> let's let's arrange that. Uh, I I think that uh, it's important to frame the conversation to to make this manageable uh, because there are many issues. So we probably need to frame the conversation and identify the intersections. And I think we all are saying that there is a lot of uncertainty. So we don't know all of the impacts. Risk management seems to be a key aspect how we manage this risk so that we don't i don't know if we cannot disaccelerate because the nature also has a pace which is not the pace of of, of the innovation and we need to to adjust and balance these different speeds uh, but uncertainty inclusiveness let's let's be inclusive on this and and manage the risk together and um, from site is happy to to support, to collaborate, and to meet all of you in, in future opportunities. Thank you, CBD, and, and all for this opportunity. Thank you, and Carlos. Dr. Clovis? No, thank you, Bala. So I would like also to echo the colleagues. Uh, I think it's critical for us to, to be engaged in each other's process and uh, not only to follow, but also to contribute to it. In the case of CSTD, we always try to bring the, the um, for each topic that we discuss to bring the relevant stakeholders and uh, really look forward for us to continue doing that and participate more. And in terms of uh, on, on the perspective that we would like to bring, of course, we to try to minimize risks, but we also want to maximize the opportunities and uh, really uh, create the space for developing countries to not be left be behind again for another technological revolution. Um, and I think that's, uh, it's, a, it's a critical message that I would like to, 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 to put at, at the end, is that uh, it, these countries can really not afford to miss uh, yet another of these technological waves. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sonia. So, uh, well, we're all repeating more or less the same message. I think yeah, there's lots of space to increase linkages across the board uh, to avoid duplication, as Marianella said at the very beginning, maximize synergies. And I think that, that one of the areas of joint work uh, is precisely this issue of awareness raising, you know, capacity building and development of, you know, uh, um, putting a, um, uh, an emphasis on where are the information gaps and where are you know we should be working together to fulfill those those information gaps and knowledge gaps to yeah uh, make the best out of this uh, collaboration thank you sonia tom thank you yes uh, um I, I, I guess the, the the key point to me that really emerges from 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 this discussion is is quite simply the importance of the interface between synthetic biology and 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 biodiversity here. Um, um, on the one hand, um, I think this is this is very much uh, uh, um, uh, uh, emphasised by the points about um, indirect implications across sectors. Um, in the IUCN assessment, we are thinking about this from the conservation perspective and the implications of um, applications of synthetic biology in other sectors on to biodiversity. But I think it actually goes all directions hearing from other panelists today. And so these, uh, these cross-sectoral interactions are, are key. Um, the other point, maybe more specifically on, um, on, on, on conservation, on the, the importance, I think is the, is the new tools one. 
and the fact that um, that conservation desperately does need new tools. There are hundreds of species threatened by diseases, by invasive alien species, by climate change, for which there are no known existing conservation responses. And the possibility, the prospect that synthetic biology implemented in ways that are, uh, are, are respectful uh, with prior informed consent guided by the kind of discussions we've had today uh, really do uh, offer offer important possibilities um, for advancement here. Thanks. Thanks so much to everybody. Thanks, Tom. Final word to you, Marinella. Thank you, Bala. I think very briefly, um, I'm just going to echo what the other colleagues have said. And, and I think that this has been just the first step uh, to share information and connecting with each other. And I think hopefully it will be just uh, one of many to come in the future for collaboration. I think now that we, you know, we are aware and we're uh, making an attempt to to network, to share information, to learn from the experience from others, uh, there is room uh, for all of us to continue doing so and, and learn from each other. So thank you. Thank you, Marinella. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot to all colleagues uh, who actually spoke as a part of the panel, to all the participants. But let me conclude by mentioning that the, uh, the discussions related to some of these issues will continue. And in fact, uh, UNAP and CVD Secretariat, we are putting together a series of webinars starting on 10th of December, uh, where uh, we actually are looking at three webinars focusing specifically on issues of synthetic biology. And the last one that looks at the linkages between the ongoing discussions on digital sequence information and synthetic biology. Where the first webinar will focus uh, on uh, having uh, hearing the industry and the science perspectives, the most recent developments in industry, the future of investments, and where the science is going, uh, with responders coming from the policy perspective. The second webinar will be more focusing on policy and regulatory aspects with responses from the industry. And the third webinar on the 11th of February would be actually bringing all the different stakeholders together in terms of providing inputs into the CBD COP. 15. And the last webinar, as I mentioned, will focus on the issue of DSI, the Digital Sequence Information and Synthetic Biology, that brings two different protocols under the convention uh, in terms of looking at the future discussions and the negotiations, both in preparation for CBD COP15 and also beyond. So certainly we will keep you informed that we send invitations. You're most welcome to join. But more importantly, I'm quite excited with the number of products and reports and, uh, you know, uh, good publications that are being planned between now and March. And certainly this will add value to our experience, to our knowledge, and also get us more prepared in terms of dealing with this complex issue of looking at the science policy interface much more closely. Over to you, Vatsi. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Bala, for the closing remarks that you have made. Um, for, for this webinar, really, um, it has been a very insightful uh, webinar and we are encouraged um, to hear from so many different perspectives and the message um, has been very clear uh, that there is scope um, for us to collaborate and uh, to coordinate and really take these discussions forward. Um, now that we know that the capital of synthetic biology is in Geneva um, and that you will all roads uh, are leading to Geneva and that from Geneva we will be able to coordinate uh, uh, on, on this collaboration. So I would like to thank um, all of the distinguished members of the panel for your insightful inputs today. Thank you uh, Bala for coordinating um, as a facilitator, my sincerest thanks um, to the Dream Team and the Secretariat um, for putting together this session and working so hard um, to put it together. The Secretariat team um, really uh, came up with uh, this uh, webinar as a, a, um, a late um, activity. You know, we are so uh, taken up by the virtual uh, world that it's very difficult to find time and to make the networks and bring together all of uh, the speakers. So we are very thankful to the speakers, but also to um, the Secretariat team and to thank all the participants for um, your 
constant uh, interest and uh, participation in these discussions on synthetic biology. It's uh, telling that the perspectives are different and we all have a different way of, of viewing um, this technology, but we've all recognized um, that there is potential for us to maximize the benefits, um, but also mitigate and minimize the risk um, as, as appropriate. And so we're looking forward uh, in this process. In the next few months, um, you have heard that there are many different um, parallel events um, that are happening and the webinars give us an excellent informal platform um, for exchanging ideas and providing important information that supports our parties and stakeholders in the various processes um, to have really informed um, decision making and have all the available information at their disposal. So thank you to everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks. Bye-bye.